Well, good afternoon, all. I hope everybody's having a, a, a great day, first day of the week. Um, we're going to be talking about spinal cord in, injury uh, spasticity today, um, and that's uh, going to take us through several different aspects. Uh, we'll talk through definitions uh, and epidemiology, as well as the specific anatomy and pathophysiology um, tied to spasticity after spinal cord injury. We'll talk a little bit about clinical uh, PERL evaluations and then discuss uh, management options. So as we're going through, let's start with the uh, definition of spasticity. So this is an increase in muscle tone that is velocity dependent. That is the faster you move a limb through its uh, range of motion, the more resistance you encounter. Um, and so this is uh, tied to hyperreflexia. Remember that hyperreflexia after spinal cord injuries uh, due to disinhibition of those supraspinal influences on the reflex arc. Uh, what is the reflex arc? Sherrington's final common pathway that includes um, afferent information coming from spindle afferents, uh, as well as the uh, subsequent efferent outflow through the alpha motor neuron to the agonist muscle group, um, causing contraction of that muscle group. So um, supraspinal inhibition is mediated through the dorsal reticulospinal tract from the ventromedial reticular formation in the medulla. Um, and again, we recognize that uh, with a spinal cord injury, you're blocking that supraspinal inhibition. That is, you have disinhibition of uh, the dampening effect on those reflex pathways. And so you see hyperreflexia and subsequently spasticity, which again is velocity dependent tone. Um, spasticity incidence uh, varies as you look through the literature, but uh, represents, is, is represented in approximately 40 to 70% of persons with spinal cord injury. Fred Maynard out of Michigan in 1990 uh, reported level of injury associated spasticity. And so for those individuals with tetraplasia, almost 90% of them uh, had tetraplasia, I'm, I'm sorry, had spasticity. Um, and those with paraplasia, approximately 50%. Um, now recognize that higher levels of paraplasia, uh, more likely to have upper motor neuron injuries. Um, so over 80% of those folks developed spasticity within the first 12 months. Um, those with T8 to T12 paraplasia, um, almost 50% of them actually had uh, significant spasticity. And then those with L1 to S5 uh, spinal cord injury and or cauda quina injury, only about 25% of those um, actually experienced significant spasticity. And recognize that this is due to the lower motor neuron nature of lower spinal cord injuries that also are taking out um, portions of the cauda equina. Um, so treatment, uh, really um, only about 25% of those folks being discharged from acute rehabilitation required uh, uh, management, uh, it, it, medical management of their spasticity, but at one year post-injury, uh, close to 50% actually are going to require some degree of spasticity management. So uh, with regard to the anatomy, physiology, the epidemiology trends uh, make sense when you take this down to the cellular level, uh, recognizing that again, we're looking at this uh, final common pathway that goes from spindle afferents um, and the muscle spindle uh, has several afferents, uh, including the 1A afferents that we're most uh, familiar with. Those are responsive to stretch. So as you stretch the muscle, it increases the activity of these 1A afferents. Um, and they say, send information uh, through the dorsal ganglion into the intermediate lateral horns of the cord. Um, and you have alpha motor neuron uh, coming back from that to cause muscle contraction um, as you come through there. Now recognize that you also have type two afferents, 
And then in addition to the alpha motor neuron that comes to the extrafusal skeletal muscle fibers, you have gamma, I'm sorry, GABA neurons. And those GABA neurons, um, those provide efferent input to the intrafusal fibers at both ends of the muscle spindle. So that as the alpha motor neuron causes the extrafusal fibers to contract, the muscle shortens in length. At the same time, at each end of the muscle spindle, the uh, GABA uh, motor neurons are uh, causing those intrafusal fibers to contract so that you maintain the sensitivity of the spindle organ um, itself. And so even as the muscle shortens, you're continuing, you have a concurrent shortening intrafusal fibers at each end of the spindle that allows you to maintain sensitivity, that is the gain of the system is maintained as you're going through that. So let's talk a little bit more about these reflex arcs and I'm gonna focus on, on this side as we are looking at input from the spindle receptors, uh, afferent impulses uh, coming into the, uh, th through the dorsal horn of the cord um, and those are going to interact with inner neurons as well as uh, alpha motor neurons directly as they uh, develop an excitatory synapse. So when you, uh, for example, tap on the patellar tendon, that is putting on stretch, uh, if you will, the quadriceps muscle tendon. Uh, that information is sent to the cord and it subsequently causes firing uh, because you have excitatory postsynaptic potentials uh, that facilitate, remember this is an all or none response that facilitate muscle contraction of the extensor muscles. At the same time, you have inhibition at the antagonist muscle group, so the hamstrings in this uh, scenario, uh, that actually decreases the likelihood that they would fire. So we use these uh, pharmacologically um, to, to help manage spasticity. Um, knowing that the excitatory postsynaptic potentials are modulated by glutamate, um, so hypopolarizing the membrane, this is going to increase the likelihood that you're going to have muscle contraction or reflex muscle contraction in response to the stretch. The inhibitory postsynaptic potentials um, are um, mediated or modulated through GABA, um, GABA amino butyric acid, and that increases the inflow of chloride and the outflow of potassium ions that hyperpolarizes so in this scenario, it's going to decrease the likelihood that your hamstrings are gonna contract. Um, that said, we can take what we know about EPSPs and IPSPs, and because we understand uh, pharmacologically how we can modify these, we can use certain medications to dampen uh, spasticity, hyperreflexia, um, and, and we'll talk about those as I get to that portion of our talk. So following the spinal cord injury, we have this period of spinal shock, uh, and typically that lasts between two and eight weeks, but can sometimes go on for months. Um, during this time, uh, you lose supraspinal facilitation, um, and you're gonna have a disinhibition of the inhibition that typically would keep reflexes under control. Nonetheless, uh, you develop a denervation supersensitivity as you have uh, less firing typically of those muscles. Um, and so you're gonna increase your cholinergic receptors um, and likely develop hypertonus. Hopefully uh, we're gonna see some motor recovery as we come through there. Um, what we worry about um, as clinicians uh, after a spinal cord injury, it's very likely that you're gonna have problematic spasticity. That is um, hyperreflexia, uh, increased tone, uh, even to very limited or minimal stimuli. Um, and so a, a lot of this is because of the increase in the activity of the EPSPs um, 
there at the cord that uh, subsequently cause firing uh, along that alpha motor neuron and cause the uh, muscles to contract. So um, problematic spasticity is just part of the upper motor neuron syndrome. Um, and remember that you have spasticity, that is velocity dependent tone. You're gonna have released uh, flexor reflexes, particularly in the lower extremity, uh, certainly weakness and then loss of dexterity. Um, you're gonna lose this inhibition that we talked about. Uh, you will see um, uh, a loss of the Renshaw uh, inhibition as you go through there. And so all of these are ultimately going to result in hyperreflexia and uh, spasticity. So we're gonna talk about how we measure uh, spasticity um, and how do, how do we assess an individual to determine um, to the degree that they have spasticity that is problematic. So we're gonna talk through the, the uh, clinical history the stretch reflex exam, the passive motion evaluation, as well as the active motion evaluation and then functional uh, examination. So all of these are necessary, these five domains, uh, to determine whether or not we need to uh, worry about treating spasticity. So the clinical uh, history is very, very important. Uh, remember that some folks with uh, spinal cord injury um, will use their spasms, will use their spasticity and hyperreflexia to facilitate functional tasks, including uh, coming to a full stand um, and uh, facilitating transfers um, out of their wheelchair. Um, now, if they, on the other hand, are having problems and they report problems with functional tasks, so for example, cathing is limited or, or um, almost uh, they're unable to do it because of the amount of tone in their um, hip adductors, uh, then that would be problematic. If it was interfering with their positioning um, and kicking them out of their chair, for example, or um, causing problems while they're trying to sleep at night with kicking them across the bed. Um, if uh, associated with the spasticity and spasms, you have pain, you wanna know the location, the distribution, the severity and quality of the pain as we typically would. What are the known triggers, I mean, triggers uh, for this? Uh, recognizing that um, we are typically gonna see more of a flexor uh, uh, um, uh, problem with our folks with spinal cord injury where the knees draw up, but you can also have an extensor tone associated with that. And again, if you have interference with sleep, this is something that you wanna consider as we talk through management strategies. So uh, the spasm frequency score represents how frequently the uh, person is having involuntary spasms of muscle groups. Um, if uh, over the course of an hour, they're not having any significant spasms, nothing, then we call that a zero. Um, the spasm score with no spontaneous spasms, except with vigorous stimulation. So if I rub my, my knuckle across their quadriceps, they may experience a, a spasm associated with that. They may have occasional spontaneous spasms that are easily induced. And so for again, uh, folks here in Miami who are sitting out with uh, in, in shorts, short pants, um, the wind blows uh, lightly across the hair on their legs, that can cause occasional uh, spasms. Um, if you're seeing somewhere between one and 10 spontaneous spasms per hour, we call that a pen spasm score of three. <clears throat> and if you have more than 10 spontaneous spasms per hour, then we rate that a pen spasm score of four. Now recognize that what we're reporting here are spasms and not spasticity. So when we uh, go to talk about spasticity, that's gonna tie into uh, the passive movement as we work through the, the limb itself. So before we get there, we're gonna talk through the stretch reflex examination. We're looking at reflexes. Normally, <clears throat> we, um, if I was to check any of you, you would typically have what we call a two plus response. When I tap your tendon, your leg jumps just a little bit, but not too, too briskly. If you check me on a given day and I've had my usual one to two pots of coffee, I may be hyperreflexia. Um, and that may not be pathologic. 
uh, under certain circumstances. But typically with our spinal cord injury folks, um, we would see a three plus or a four plus uh, reflex exam, uh, usually at the knees, but potentially at, uh, at, at the ankles as well. Um, and we might see four plus, remember, uh, represents clonus. What is clonus? So, so clonus is where you have uh, hyper reflexia on both sides of the joint. So when you push the, um, the foot up, for example, and you're holding onto the heel very quickly, that puts the plantar flexors on stretch. So you have one afferents going from the gastroxylaeus complex to the cord, alpha motor neuron back down to the um, gastroxylaeus complex and causes contraction, which then uh, results in plantar flexion. When you plantar flex quickly like that, <coughs> excuse me, then you put the dorsiflexors on stretch and you have one afferent information going from the dorsiflexors tibialis anterior, back up to the cord and back down to the dorsiflexors, causing a dorsiflexion reflex response, which puts a plantar flexors on stretch. And you go through this series of hyperreflexia on both sides of the joint we call clonus. You may also see long track signs, including um, when you do a Babinski maneuver to the lateral sole of the foot, um, you're likely to see an upgoing toe, uh, for example. The equivalent in the upper extremities is called what? <clears throat> Anyone? This is where I, I check and see if anybody's still listening or um, <clears throat> knows what we're talking about. The equivalent to a Babinski response, which occurs in the lower extremities. The equivalent in the upper extremities is called a... Hoffman. Thank you, Hoffman's uh, reflex. And that's when you flick the middle finger and you see the thumb. Uh, I don't know if you can see it on my uh, computer screen, but when you flick that middle finger, the thumb will reflexively uh, flex um, as you're going through there. So these represent uh, stretch reflex examinations. Um, where do we check them? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Excuse me. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. So one being S1. So that's the ankle jerk uh, reflex. We're going to record that. 234 is L234, quadriceps, so the patellar knee jerk. Um, C5 is at the biceps. C6, the brachioradialis or extensor carpi radialis longus and brevis. And C7 is at the triceps. So we're going to report out each of those reflexes, S1, L234, C5, C6, and C7, as either being zero, where you have no uh, reflex response, or one plus, which is diminished, all the way up to a four plus, which is with clonus. So when we talk about spasticity and documenting spasticity, we use the Ashworth scale relatively infrequently. Um, most of the time we're actually reporting out the modified Ashworth scale. So this again is where we're moving the limb through its range of motion. Um, and the faster we move it, the more resistance we encounter. A score of zero is where you have no increase in tone. As I move the limb through its full range of motion, I get no resistance. A score of one on the modified Ashworth scale is a slight increase in tone at the end of the range of motion. So as I move through, I only get uh, some resistance at the very end of the range of motion. I would count that as an Ash modified Ashworth scale one. One plus is where I have a slight increase in tone manifested by a catch partway through the range of motion, usually even before halfway uh, through the range of motion. And I would uh, score that as a one plus. A two um, says that we've got marked increase in tone through most of the range of motion, but the affected part is easily moved. So I start to move it and I encounter resistance throughout, but not a lot of resistance. Um, a three, uh, is considerable increased tone. As I go through this, passive movement is difficult as I try to bring the, rain, uh, the limb through its full range of motion. And a four on the modified Ashworth score reflects the affected part is rigid in flexion or extension. And it's really difficult. You can try to move it. Um, and as you uh, score a four, you have to also distinguish, is this a contracture or is it truly 
modified Ashworth scales, this reflective of spasticity. So uh, keep that in mind as you're going through there. Active motion, now again, this is where we're asking the person to voluntarily move their limb through its full range of motion. Um, so we're uh, likely to see some antagonist muscle contraction uh, that limits uh, our ability. Um, so if I ask somebody, uh, for example, with paraplegia, high paraplegia, to extend their leg, um, they may have an incomplete spinal cord injury and they try to extend their leg fully, uh, but they're not able to. Is that because uh, they don't have the strength to overcome gravity or is it that they don't have the strength to overcome the spasticity of the hamstring group, uh, for example? So uh, this is going to be very important for us to determine, particularly if, if I'm going to be putting somebody on um, an anti-spasticity medication. Um, one of the things that I'm doing is hoping to unmask their voluntary strength and improve their functional abilities. Um, so speaking of the functional examination, what am I looking at there? Um, is, uh, if I watch the person, uh, I say, okay, so I want you to prepare yourself as if you were gonna do an intermittent catheterization. And this is part of my examination, my functional evaluation. If they can't spread their legs sufficiently to be able to do that because of adductor tone, um, so obturator nerve, uh, is, is generating the spasticity there, uh, then that's gonna be problematic and something that we need to consider. Is it interfering with their ability to sit um, uh, in, in, in terms of their balance? Is it throwing them off? Or are they using their tone to facilitate uh, sitting and or standing? And so I wanna know, does that hyperreflexia increase spasticity interfere with the, their mobility? Um, again, Recognize that some folks are going to use their spasms, use their hyperreflexia to facilitate functional standing or functional transfers. And in that case, if I start trying to treat their spasticity or spasms, um, I could potentially take away their functional abilities. And so you're going to be constantly weighing uh, spasticity um, and spasms that are useful as opposed to are problematic. And, and that's gonna be the basis for moving forward with uh, management strategies. Now recognize that this is all about EPSPs, okay? Excitatory postsynaptic potentials. And all of those things that we talked about last week that um, can provoke autonomic dysreflexia with the sympathetic outflow, vasoconstriction uh, of the splanchnic vascular bed and subsequently hypertensive crisis. All of those uh, inputs are also noxious and increasing excitatory postsynaptic potentials at uh, particularly the lower extremities. And so a person with uh, tetraplegia who is having autonomic dysreflexia is very likely uh, also having increased spasticity, hyperreflexia, and spasms. A person with an injury below T6 who doesn't get autonomic dysreflexia may have had stable spasticity on medications or off, um, and then suddenly it's flared up. Why has it flared up? Because you have a noxious stimuli below the level of the spinal cord injury, and it's going to cause hyperreflexia um, even in those folks who aren't at risk for autonomic dysreflexia. But for folks with... Uh, T6 and above spinal cord injury, you're going to see hyperreflexia and likely autonomic dysreflexia uh, associated with it. So, so when do I treat? How, how do I make uh, decisions on whether or not we should be managing uh, the person's spasticity and spasms? And it, and it really comes down to, um, is the spasticity and spasms uh, causing problems with their functional tasks. If those spasms are harmful, if it's interfering with positioning, if it's causing pain, then we are probably gonna to want to treat that. But we're gonna have the discussion with the patient uh, to make sure that they understand uh, pluses and minuses of moving forward with this. Um, if the spasms and, and spasticity are interfering with activities of daily living, hygiene, and self-care, 
It makes it easier for us to discuss with the patient. These are the things that we're gonna to try to improve for you. And you can actually have assessments with our uh, occupational therapy, for example, to look at activities of daily living um, as we're going through the process. If um, the uh, spasm spasticity is interfering with sleep, sleep um, will, poor sleep hygiene will contribute to pain and depression and those types of things. And so again, um, if we can manage spasticity, uh, and I'll say nocturnal spasticity, when a person is trying to sleep, then that may improve their sleep hygiene, may diminish their, their pain responses, may improve their overall outlook and uh, diminish their uh, depression, anxiety, et cetera. And then pain uh, speaks for itself. So I'm gonna talk through the stepwise strategy of spasticity management. Recognize that um, this is typically how I would move forward, but uh, for some folks, they will skip the stretching and positioning and move directly to cold and tens, or they'll skip both of those and go directly to oral pharmacotherapies. Um, most of the time, folks will have trialed um, oral medications before they would move on to intrathecal uh, management. Uh, so for example, with baclofen, um, and, uh, and then we consider other um, interventions, including neurolysis and potentially surgical options. So this is a stairwise approach. It doesn't always have to occur in this sequence, although most of the time, this is the sequence that I would at least advocate moving forward with. So the physical modalities, um, somebody can remind me who this action picture, uh, action figure is supposed to represent. Anyone? This is again where I just check to see if folks are listening. Uh, fantastic for Professor, uh, it's escaping me. Reed Richards. Is, is Reed not on the call today? That might have explained it. So yes. Um, he's, he's the stretch guy. Uh, and we recognize that passive stretching will reduce the gain of the muscle spindles um, for up to a couple of hours. And so by stretching, by moving the limb through its range of motion, for example, uh, the, at the knee, ranging the knee um, over several minutes can actually reduce the gain of the spindle system um, or spindle organ uh, for a couple of hours, the person may have significant benefit uh, from that. Most of the time though, um, you're gonna have to stretch every one to two hours to be able to maintain that, uh, that function. Um, and so one of the other considerations with regard to stretching is remember that when you um, have a muscle shortened because of hyperreflexia and spasms, it shortens because over time, it reduces the number of sarcomeres that are in series. And so if we can stretch that muscle, that shortened muscle, um, and then maintain it uh, either with a dynamic splint or with serial casting, you're gonna stretch it um, and you're gonna, over the course of the next week, you'll actually add one or two sarcomeres to the length of that muscle. So then you can gain another inch or two and you recast it or reset your dynamic splint so that over the course of usually several months, you have increased the number of sarcomeres now in that muscle and you've overcome what had become a, a muscle contracture. By increasing the number of sarcomeres in series, you actually increase the uh, resting muscle length. And so that's that's an option as we go through this. Recognize that uh, posture and positioning are gonna be very important for our folks, particularly with tetraplegia who are in power chairs, um, if, uh, but also in manual chairs. If they are not sitting appropriately, if they are sitting in a way that causes a noxious stimuli, for example, their thoracolumbar lumbar spine uh, facet joints uh, and or they've de developed a spondylitic changes um, in the spine, that pain would cause increased EPSPs and spasms, spasticity. Um, and so as much as possible, we want to re-achieve um, a good 
setting balance that is going to minimize painful or noxious stimuli back to the cord. Um, so trying to keep them at a 90, 90, 90 uh, scenario uh, can be helpful. Recognize also uh, we want to avoid sacral sitting uh, because, oh, that could cause a pressure injury, which would also increase EPSPs um, and increase spasticity and spasms. Um, so maintaining the head in the midline, the truck and, uh, trunk and pelvis in neutral alignment unless they are fixed otherwise. Uh, so because of um, uh, fusion, for example, um, there may be, it may be necessary that we're going to have to modify their seating system to accommodate uh, a uh, kyphoscoliosis, for example, and or pelvic malalignment um, in order to relieve uh, pressure uh, that are on those elements as they're going through. So cryotherapy, why does cryotherapy work? Um, basically, we're decreasing the intramuscular temperature and, and subsequently decreasing the gain of the muscle spindles. So if you um, apply cold uh, over your quadriceps, for example, uh, for 15 to 20 minutes, um, basically, and you actually measure the afferent output from the spindles, uh, looking at the 1A afferents, you'll see that while uh, prior to the um, application of cryotherapy, uh, they may be firing like that. After cryotherapy, they may have very few taps in between. And so you've essentially decreased the gain of the system and made their responsiveness to stretch less. Uh, and that's what you're looking to do with this. Uh, recognize that cryotherapy is also going to reduce nerve conduction velocity. That's why you guys in the EMG laboratory are gonna be warming limbs up uh, to make sure that you've got an appropriately measured, physiologically measured nerve conduction velocity. Um, you're also gonna see a reduction in tendon reflexes and clonus as you decrease the gain of the muscle spindle. Um, but you have to be very careful about the application of cryotherapy for folks who are insensate because it can actually cause tissue damage. Surprisingly, there are no controlled studies evaluating the long-term impact of cryotherapy on spasticity and spasms. What about electrical stimulation? So we can use transcutaneous electroneuromuscular stimulation or TENS units to um, also to reduce pain uh, and subsequently EPSPs to the uh, final common pathways, uh, particularly in the lower extremities, but also in, in the upper extremities. And so stimulation of the antagonist muscle group may decrease spasticity because of reciprocal inhibition that we talked about on one of those earlier slides. So now I wanna spend some time going through pharmacotherapeutic options. Then we will go into intrathecal options and talk about surgical, well, neurolysis and then surgical options moving forward. So the key, um, our, our pharmacopoeia basically uh, when we look at spasticity management has to do with GABA agonists, alpha agonists, and then dantrolene sodium. So the GABA agonists that we're going to discuss, the lyorosol and benzodiazepines work by increasing the inhibitory postsynaptic potentials. Um, so we're going to talk about the GABA agonists first, or I'm going to try to, I seem to be stuck. Oh, here we go. So lyorosol or baclofen or gablofen basically is GABA aminobutyric acid. Um, it has a mean half-life of somewhere around three and a half to four hours. And again, it's key mechanism of action. Uh, remember this provides presynaptic inhibition of the GABA receptors, hyperpolarizing the membrane. It increases the inhibitory postsynaptic potentials uh, so that Remember at the axon hillock of your alpha motor neuron, the axon hillock um, actually uh, is measuring the number of EPSPs and IPSPs, and you have to have a certain number of surplus EPSPs before you will fire all or none along that uh, alpha motor neuron. So if you increase the inhibitory postsynaptic potentials, uh, 
you make it less likely that alpha motor neuron is going to fire. And so using a medication like Lyarosol is basically decreasing the IPSP, I'm sorry, increasing the IPSPs and making it less likely that you're going to have uh, activation of that alpha motor neuron. Typically starting dose around five milligrams TID for an elderly population or pediatric population. Most of the time in, in folks between the mid-teens and I would say uh, 50s or so, um, I will start with 10 milligrams TID. Um, now the PDA says that you have, I'm sorry, the PDR, the physician's desk reference, say that you have a max dosing of uh, lyorosol to 80 milligrams a day, and that's very safe. Um, however, in practice, uh, those of us who are managing spinal cord injury um, on a daily basis will typically go up to 30 uh, milligrams, 40 milligrams, four times a day. I've gone as high as 60 uh, before we had uh, intrathecal baclofen available to us before I saw a response. However, as you go higher and higher doses, you're going to see more and more side effects, particularly sedation, uh, fatigue, and what the person may perceive is as relative weakness. Also recognize that lyorosol, baclofen, actually decreases seizure threshold. And so as you go at higher um, doses, remember an abrupt withdrawal of those uh, medications could cause a seizure and or hallucinations uh, in uh, folks who uh, typically are at uh, 30 milligrams a day and above, but sometimes even 20 milligrams four times a day uh, will cause, um, a, an abrupt withdrawal will cause seizures and hallucinations. Now, whereas baclofen um, works uh, on the GABA B receptors, um, diazepam, uh, is actually working on the GABA-A uh, receptors. Um, and yet causing the same kind of influence, it's increasing the inhibitory postsynaptic potentials. Um, so you have a half-life of between 20 and 70 hours for diazepam. Uh, its active metabolite uh, has a half-life of somewhere between 30 and 100 hours. Um, so typically we'll start uh, with lower doses, recognizing that diazepam is likely to have cognitive slowing and sedating effects even to a much greater extent than baclofen. Um, you don't typically wanna go above 20 milligrams four times a day. However, um, if the person is having nocturnal spasms, it might be that you only need to provide um, one dose, five milligrams at night and that's going to be all the spasticity medication that individual needs. Um, typically, if I've got somebody on baclofen, I won't put them on uh, diazepam as well, um, because essentially they're, they're using the same mechanisms. Um, the only uh, caveat for that would be for those folks who are experiencing significant nocturnal spasticity that I think is going to be... Um, uh, beneficially managed by adding in uh, diazepam at night. Uh, similar side effects, sedation, hypotension, depression. Um, I think um, the next one uh, we, we call gabapentin. Uh, uh, Neurontin is the uh, trade name for it. Um, and while I've got it in this category, it actually doesn't affect the GABA receptors, uh, surprisingly. Now it may inhibit the voltage sensitive calcium uh, ion channels, um, but probably the way that gabapentin works, neurontin works uh, for folks on, on spasticity is by decreasing the neuropathic pain that they're experiencing below the level of the injury. That is a nociceptive input. And so oftentimes I will see folks reduce their spasticity um, because of a, a consequent or, or, or a, a concurrent reduction in pain, that is uh, uh, lower extremity uh, pain in particular below the level of the injury, um, and that subsequently decreases the EPSPs. So um, while the first two, Lyorosol and Valium that we talked about, increase IPSPs, probably gabapentin um, 
works by decreasing the EPSPs. Um, that said, let's talk about other uh, medications that will decrease EPSPs, the excitatory postsynaptic potentials. So uh, catapress is an alpha agonist. Um, and again, it works by decreasing glutamate and therefore decreasing the excitatory postsynaptic potentials experienced at the axon hillock so that you're less likely to fire the alpha motor neuron. So again, starting with a relatively uh, small dose um, orally um, and or using a patch, recognize that this is likely to cause orthostatic hypotension. And so for those folks who already have neurogenic hypotension, I typically won't use clonidine. Typically, I won't use the other uh, alpha agonist that we use a fair amount, tizanidine, in those folks who are already experiencing neurogenic hypotension. I will start with baclofen most of the time. Um, recognizing that, again, one of the key side effects associated with tizanidine is uh, drowsiness, weakness, and a, and a mild, not as severe as you see with catapress, hypotension. So the other uh, consideration to manage spasticity uh, uh, is uh, a calcium channel blocker like dantrolene. Um, I typically won't use dantrolene in persons with spinal cord injury because it inhibits calcium release from the sarcoplasmic reticulum of all muscle groups, even those that are voluntarily um, activated. And so, um, to consider using dantrolene for somebody with a C5 or a C6 spinal cord injury is also um, to consider taking away functional activation of those muscle groups. Um, so most of the time I will steer clear of this. When I do use this is when I've got somebody with a locked in syndrome or cerebral palsy who is gonna benefit uh, because they have whole body spasticity that is interfering with their function. Um, for, uh, for all of these medications, but especially for dantrolene, we're gonna be needing to monitor liver, fun uh, liver function tests. Now, I wanna spend a few minutes talking about the intrathecal delivery of particularly Lyorosol. Um, wouldn't it be nice because you have all of these side effects associated with Bactin, particularly it's sedating, uh, and, and potentially causing a drop in blood pressure, if you can use smaller amounts and just bathe the, uh, the cord uh, and actually the area of um, the ventral horn where your alpha motor neuron is receiving the EPSPs and IPSPs, then you could have a very targeted uh, specific effect as you go through there. So I would provide this for somebody who has a suboptimal response to oral medications. Um, or who is experiencing excessive side effects with those oral, oral medications, particularly bac baclofen, um, so that I could use a, a much lower but focally mediated uh, uh, benefit uh, as, as we are bathing essentially the ventral horns of the cord. Um, I will typically just, just go to a 75 or 100 microgram dose because I wanna see if it's gonna work. Um, the, uh, the insurance guidelines tell us that a successful trial is when you see a two point drop in modified Ashworth scale at several muscle groups. Um, however, uh, because uh, it doesn't always relate to a two point drop, but uh, the administration of intrathecal baclofen can significantly improve functional tasks like cathing, like bowel care, um, like uh, uh, seated transfers, um, we would typically have an occupational therapist during the trial, the intrathecal baclofen trial, uh, that test dose basically is, is gonna wear off typically within three hours, four hours or so. And so we will have our occupational therapists and or physical therapists do their assessments before the administration. And then um, at one hour intervals after the administration, uh, to see if they have a significant drop in their modified Ashworth scale or functional tasks. And I will indicate what those specific tasks are gonna be. Now, contraindications to intrathecal baclofen, um, those who have failed a screening trial, those with infections, uh, uh, particularly uh, 
central uh, CSF infections or who have a, an allergy to baclofen, it's probably not a good idea to administer it intrathecally. Well, no, that was completely, you don't, uh, if somebody has a baclofen allergy, you don't administer it uh, into the intrathecal space. Relative contraindications, those who have psychosocial issues that could limit their follow-up. Um, we recognize that once you use a baclofen pump, if it runs dry, the person could go into baclofen withdrawal. Um, those with a psychiatric history who have inadequate body mass or, and or are planning to get pregnant, uh, recognize that uh, as uh, gestation occurs, uh, as the uh, uterus expands, the uh, fetus grows inside, it could actually stretch the tubing uh, that goes through uh, for administration of the intrathecal back to, to the space. So these are relative contraindications. Uh, we can talk through those to a greater extent as you want to. Uh, remember that your, um, your uh, reservoir itself is about the size of a hockey puck. Um, and uh, basically you have on one end of this, the uh, tubing that is gonna go into the intrathecal space. Um, you've got a port here. Uh, that is uh, like a rubber port basically that you can inject, you can withdraw medication and you always should uh, before you do a pump refill uh, so that you know that you've gotten all the back fun out of there and you know exactly how much is uh, being placed back in there. You can set this with a programmer um, to uh, release back fun at a specific dose and you can uh, set it for different doses at different times of the day. So a person who has problems, particularly with nocturnal spasticity, um, you're gonna give them potentially a higher dose at night to allow them to sleep, uh, for example. Another uh, aspect of this, I know the neurosurgeons don't like to go up into the cervical space. You worry about the potential effect on the uh, diaphragm, uh, intercostal muscles, and the person's ability to breathe. Um, but uh, in the thoracic space, if you put it there, then people are saying, well, what about upper extremity spasticity. I was hoping that this would take care of that. Well, you can, uh, because typically you're only gonna experience that with folks with tetraplegia. And if you're administering the, um, the baclofen, say to the T5 uh, intrathecal space, then you have the person recline uh, in their chair or tilt, I should say, in their chair, you can bathe the uh, cervical elements of the cord as well. And they can have a significant uh, benefit from that just by going back into that position uh, for 30 minutes or so, and they will experience the effects for the next uh, three and a half to four hours. So upper extremity spasticity can also be managed is all I'm saying with an intrathecal baclofen pump, even if it's placed at the thoracic, uh, mid thoracic level. So again, you're uh, delivering um, the uh, medication into the int intrathecal space uh, and basically bathing the ventral horns uh, where you have the axon hillock sum summating the EPSPs and IPSPs as you're going through this. Um, so the benefits are you can deliver a high concentration of the medication uh, with fewer side effects and you don't have to take a medication every day um, or even every other day. Uh, you basically, you refill at approximately three month uh, uh, doses depending upon the reservoir and the concentration of the medication that you have uh, in the, uh, the baclofen pump itself. Risks include uh, surgical procedure, as you would expect, uh, infections. There's the uh, potential for pump malfactor malfunction and more frequently a catheter uh, occlusion or dislodgement. Um, you can have medication uh, related side effects, uh, but most likely um, to cause problems is an operator that doesn't understand how to program the pump effectively, how to dose uh, during refills and, and that type of thing. Now that said, if I have somebody with an intrathecal baclofen pump, I also give them several days supply of oral baclofen um, because uh, if the pump malfunctions, if for example, they get caught uh, somewhere in Alaska and can't uh, refill uh, 
um, then they need to have the oral medication present, not just to help with their spasticity, but to make sure that they don't go into baclofen withdrawal. Um, and then I wanna spend just a couple of minutes talking about nerve blocks um, and uh, neurolysis. The nice thing about this is uh, if you don't have whole body spasticity and you have focal um, uh, place that you want to, so for example, um, somebody with an incomplete spinal cord injury who uh, is ambulating, but having problems with posterior tibialis uh, spasticity, you could go in and do a focal block. Uh, so for example, with Botox to the posterior tib and have three to six months of, uh, of ambulation without having to deal with that uh, posterior tib spasticity. Um, phenol, sometimes used, not very often, uh, the only time that I've actually used it, because you don't want to administer it to a mixed nerve, it will cause significant neuropathic pain uh, because of the afferent elements. But if you have um, a nerve such as obturator, obturator spri uh, sprigs, basically that are pure motor, um, that can work very, very well to offset somebody who's got a significant amount of uh, adductor tone preventing uh, intermittent catheterization, for example. Um, let's see if I can get my, uh, oh no, I, I lost it. Um, my video to play. The presynaptic neuromuscular nerve ending contains membranous vesicles prepared to release its stored neurotransmitter, acetylcholine. Neuronal stimulation initiates a cascade of events that leads to the fusion of the neurotransmitter containing vesicle with a nerve membrane. This process is facilitated by a group of proteins comprising the snare complex. The membrane fusion results in the release of acetylcholine into the synaptic cleft by a process of exocytosis. The acetylcholine diffuses and eventually binds to receptors on the muscle, leading to muscle contraction. Botox, botulinum toxin type A, consists of a heavy chain of 100 kilodalton and a light chain of 50 kilodalton, making up the 150 kilodalton core type A molecule. The toxin is protected by accessory hemagglutinin and non-toxic non-hemagglutinin proteins, yielding a uniform 900 kilodalton complex. This illustration shows a cross-section of the spine with a motor neuron extending into the muscle and a sensory neuron extending out of the muscle. After injection of Botox, it would be expected that most of the neurotoxin would remain at the injection site. The Botox core molecule dissociates from the accessory proteins and targets the nerve endings. The binding domain of the Botox core molecule is the C-terminal portion of the heavy chain with an acceptor on the nerve. The Botox core molecule enters the nerve cell by a process of receptor-mediated endocytosis. It is the heavy chain that contains the binding domain. The toxin is now contained in a membranous vesicle inside the cell. Soon after, the light chain is released into the cytoplasm of the nerve terminal, where it begins to cleave one of the snare proteins. In motor neurons, the light chain of the Botox core molecule blocks the release of acetylcholine by cleaving SNAP25, which is an essential component of the snare complex. When acetylcholine cannot be released, muscle contraction cannot occur. So uh, the whole point here is uh, Botox uh, works presynaptically to prevent the release of uh, acetylcholine. It will last for somewhere between uh, uh, three to six months um, and can be used certainly in sp uh, skeletal muscle, but we also use it in uh, detrusor sphincter dyssinergia, uh, for example, as a way to manage uh, uh, neurogenic bladder. So that said, wanting to move forward and I'm stuck. Oh, went too far. There are uh, the potential side effects of uh, Botox is once, once you've had it in play, um, it's going to remain in play for approximately three to six months. And so uh, recognize that there's also the possibility of developing antibody-mediated resistance. Um, 
after several injections, uh, this may be an issue that you're gonna have to contend with as well. And then finally, surgical treatments uh, include irre irreversible ablation of the afferent tracts. So for example, dorsal rhizotomies, um, chordotomies, myelotomies. Um, sometimes folks will do tendon uh, lengthening procedures um, because they're still wanting to maintain some um, degree of tone or voluntary function. Um, so the, this is the quick overlay of uh, spasticity management after spinal cord injury. Um, we've got just a couple minutes left for questions. Happy to uh, take those now. Uh, there was something in the chat function. In spinal cord injury or stroke, is there an association between the level of spasticity and muscle mass and bone density? Yes, um, that's the short answer. Um, and so I do try to uh, talk patients into having a certain amount of spasticity and tone to maintain some muscle mass and bone mass. Um, so, uh, and, and the other thing is that muscle, uh, as it's contracting through a reflex response is also burning some calories. So one of the things that we often see when we, for example, use intrathecal baclofen pumps in patients uh, who have had a significant amount of tone and I'll say particularly with children with cerebral palsy, but, but it does apply to spinal cord injury as well. Um, when you put them on a baclofen pump and manage their spasticity, everybody's very, very happy about that. But if you didn't recognize that that's going to decrease their energy needs and they're getting fed with tube feeds, for example, a lot of these children will gain, rate, will gain weight fairly rapidly, fat weight, because they've not offset the energy intake. Uh, that is now no longer being uh, countered by the muscle spasticity and tone. Good question. Other questions, thoughts, or concerns? All right, hopefully folks are still awake and, and I've just answered things so well that you don't need additional uh, clarification. So thank you for your time and attention. Um, as before, these will uh, be available uh, online uh, through YouTubes. And thank, uh, we thank the uh, Miami Project to Cure Paralysis uh, for making those available. Everybody have a great day and enjoy uh, the rest of it. <laughs>